Welcome to Dayline Health. This is Fred Lippman coming to you from Nova Southeastern University. And uh, we had some interesting questions that came to us. I, as I always tell you, this is your show. And uh, we've uh, had the pleasure of having some physicians and individuals from uh, Nicholas Children's Hospital on show, oh, about six, eight months ago. And uh, a lot of it had to do, the questions had to do with uh, biomedical engineering uh, relative to certain prostheses and how do we deal with uh, special needs children. So what do you do? You bring the experts, right? So uh, let me introduce first John Michelle, who is uh, a biomedical, uh, I guess you could say engineer, who's a graduate of the University of Miami, soon to be going to medical school. And uh, you're with the Nicholas Children's Hospital, right? And I'll introduce to you Dr. Aaron Berger, uh, who's a pediatric hand surgeon. Interesting. Pediatric hand surgeon. Tell me how specialized your practice is. Uh, so for the most part, I, I, I'm also a plastic surgeon, first and foremost a plastic surgeon, so I treat a variety of problems that children are either born with or uh, have a traumatic injury and require some form of reconstruction, and that can involve virtually any part of the body, typically focused on either the face or the hands, and my interest is primarily in hand surgery. And the, the problems that I treat are, like I said, uh, either uh, problems that children are either born with or sustain as a traumatic injury. And comes along John, Michelle, or Michael? Michelle. Michelle. Uh, and he is a biomedical engineer. And how does he join up with Dr. Berger? John? So I had actually volunteered for uh, quite a while at Miami Children's Hospital as um, a bedside buddy and I heard of Dr. Berger and his amazing work so I had actually asked to shadow him and fortuitously he mentioned that he had a 3D printer and that he had been working on this project so I asked if I could help him with it. Well uh, explain to the folks what this project is. Right so um, basically the concept is we use a 3D printer which is basically a machine that can make three-dimensional objects of really any choosing you want and used it to build prosthetic hands for some of these kids who have partial hand deformities that Dr. Berger sees. I see. Uh, here at Nova Southeastern University, we have, uh, in essence, three th 3D printers, one in our library, which is used by our researchers and uh, students who are PhD fellows. And uh, the other two, believe it or not, are being used in our dental school. Uh, you know, the old days, oh, I shouldn't say that because um, I, it, there are many, many wonderful prosthodontics uh, physicians uh, who still r replace the tooth structure uh, by doing, uh, you know, molds and, and replacements. Uh, it's, it's an artistry, it's a, but the, uh, there is a new process in which uh, replacement teeth are created by a 3D printer. Exactly. Uh, it must be a wonderful feeling to know that uh, what you're doing for these young children who are born without any reason or knowledge to the fact that that's what's going to happen. So why don't we talk about it? Yeah, you know, I think in general, sometimes life is unfair. And to start life with a disability is uh, a challenge. This is one of the reasons why I decided to become a plastic surgeon, and in many ways, one of the reasons I decided to become a hand surgeon and ultimately focus on pediatric hand problems. Um, because it's, as a human being, it's so important to have f a functional hand. Um, and uh, there are so many things that have been developed with respect to surgical technology and surgical techniques that. Um, allow us to change how the hand is shaped and how the hand functions. And, in, and we always hope that we're improving function and improving form. Um, but um, one of the reasons why I ended up starting this project was that there are oftentimes children who present for which we don't have a good surgical technique or a good answer from the surgical world 
for how to make their function better. <clears throat> And well, well, go ahead. You're pointing to something. Oh, so we, we, so this is not this is not our invention necessarily, but um, we are able to create this in my office. And it, it turns out I would not be surprised if there are students at Nova Southeastern that are printing these in the library. Um, it turns out there's a, an online network where um, people can actually download the designs and build these prosthetic hands for for adults or children who um, have a hand disability or hand deformity, for which surgery may not necessarily be the right answer, or for, for which surgery maybe we don't even have an, a technique to help them yet. Um, or that, and what I'm getting to, and ultimately we can talk about, is hand transplantation, but we're not quite there yet um, with respect to that being a mainstream or uh, mainstream treatment for, for children who are missing fingers or missing, missing their hands. Um, but uh, the, the problem with prostheses for children is that they tend to outgrow them. They tend to be very expensive, professionally manufactured prostheses. And uh, not everyone is, is considered a candidate for those reasons, that they either don't have access to a professional prosthetist or they're likely to outgrow their prosthesis quite quickly or or there's a, a concern that they'll break their prostheses. Now, professionally manufactured prostheses are quite expensive, and uh, and by no means are John and I prosthetists, but um, we've seen this as sort of a, a viable option or a stepping stone that provides children with an opportunity to have something in a location where they may have nothing right now. So, John, tell me uh, how you got involved with this. I mean, I, uh, other than, you know, uh, uh, rotating through uh, the Nicholas Children's uh, Hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, there must have been some interest that you had. And uh, what brought you to this uh, and the creation of uh, these mm -hmm. prostheses? Well, I'm, well, so, like I said, working with children at that hospital really gave me um, an impetus to want to help them in whatever way possible and using some of my biomedical engineering knowledge in that pursuit is something that I really wanted to involve. Um, so that's like the main reason in terms of... Yeah. And then and, and what made you in your mind say that I could use this new 3D technology, this mm -hmm. new printing technology, which a lot of people, you might want to do some simple explanation to our audience as mm -hmm. to what actually happens. I mean, you're right. just not taking a picture. Right. So, yeah. So in 3D, three dimensional printing in our case, it's basically an additive manufacturing procedure, which means that this machine is adding material until it builds what you want. So um, in our case, it works a lot like a hot glue gun. So it actually takes material in, uh, melts it, and then kind of spits it out. And it does this layer by layer until it builds really the structure you want. Um, in terms of, I guess, how I got really involved in this, I'd really put that a lot on the Enabling the Future website and all the work they've done in terms of making these designs very available and showing anyone how, who has a 3D printer how they can really be involved in such a process. And what is that website? So we can put it up to, for all the wonderful young, and you are young, yes. with all due <laughs> respect, uh, uh, people that are out there, uh, the, the, the researchers, the PhD fellows, the, the doc doctors to be, the dentists to be, the other individuals that are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. how, what's the website? It's enabling the future. Enabling the future. Right. And uh, what is it? Just enabling the future. Dot com. Uh, I think it's dot edu. Dot no, edu. It's dot org. I think. Dot org. Dot org. It's dot right. Org. Mm -hmm. They should be able to find it. So it's enabling yeah. the future. Dot right. org. Right. And they and uh, so what's actually really amazing about it is that anyone can download a design and not only print it but modify it and improve upon it. So on that website, you can find multiple different types of hand designs. Um, as well as many tools for building it for a child you may be uh, interested in. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in this case, it would be if you're, a child is missing um, their thumb versus not missing a thumb, uh, there's prosthetics for both types. So there's really a lot of resources available there, as well as even a map where uh, volunteers can put their position, and then um, people who are actually uh, need a hand can also put their position as well and be matched such that um, you can really be involved. In it. Well, that's really... Wonderful, I think. The, the actual web, the, the fascinating thing about the website is that that was the whole point of it. It was based off of, the, the designs were already there, and the story behind these 3D printed 
hands or prosthetic hands is actually based upon an interaction that a South African carpenter who had cut his fingers off and was determined to build his own prosthetic hand had with a professional puppeteer in Seattle. And it turned out that one of the 3D printer companies had given them each a printer and said, you guys work on building this. And they built something called the Robo Hand. It was broadcast by that company on YouTube and a professor at Rochester Institute of Technology, a gentleman by the name of John Scholl, had seen their video and said, wow, this is amazing. They're making these hands and there's all these children that could use these hands. How do I link them up? And he created something called the Google Mashup. I've never done it, but I suspect it's quite easy. And from that Google Mashup, he was able to link people who had 3D printers, uh, hobbyists mostly, who were looking for things to do with their new toy, and people who, parents basically, of children who had been born uh, missing fingers or who had sustained a traumatic injury in which they had lost their fingers, to build the hands for these kids. And then from there, this website was founded. And what's interesting now is that the NIH is actually managing most of the designs and the libraries of these hand designs. Let me ask you just a curious question on my part. I'm just, while I'm listening to you. So I learn a lot of things just that my audience does and listening. Uh, I would assume it, it goes beyond the prosthetic nature of hands. Not yet. And no? I think part of it has to do with the strength of the material that we're using. I see. Uh, it, 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 it isn't quite strong enough. And um, the ability to, the intricacies, and, and I, don't, I, I don't know enough about professional, being a professional prosthetist, but the, um, ins my sense is that the insurance coverage and the um, ability to fabricate um, lower extremity prostheses is um, less complex than a hand that requires moving parts. Mm -hmm. But there is, just thinking about it, there must be some, it, it's not very far away. Mm -hmm. Someone other than someone in South Africa and a puppeteer in Seattle are going to be talking to each other from other venues. Without question. And it's yeah. going to happen. It's going to happen. Uh, and the reason I think of it is because uh, we happen to have a, a very large contingent of uh, veterans that are uh, being educated here at Nova Southeastern University. Uh, not too many of the people that I have met uh, I have uh, prosthetic uh, arms or legs or otherwise, but there are a number. It, it must be fascinating to know that there's an application available for aiding and uh, bringing them to be whole individuals, although mentally and spiritually they're whole, but as far as the body's concerned, they're not. Yeah, and I, you know, I think even more important than possibly the functional aspects of these, of, of these devices is the aspect that children can actually, and theoretically if we're making them for adults, can modify them before we even print them out and put things on them or aspects to them that they think resembles them or has some important meaning to them. So there is in many ways an opportunity to make them more mm -hmm. psychologically whole. And uh, then it, it, it's interesting to, you know, the first thing, the first time we gave one to a, a young girl, the first thing she wanted to do was go to the mall and show it off. And she was excited to go to school and show it off. And she wasn't going to school with a difference that she was born with, but she was going to school with this cool new device that everybody was interested in. That's really wonderful. And you must feel pretty good about it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's actually amazing that, uh, just as Dr. Berger mentioned, one of the, I think, the biggest strengths is that when you're doing this kind of uh, 3D printing work, we're not actually trying to really replicate 100% the hand. If you look at the device, it's not even 100%. Like, there's a lot of aspects that you could potentially make it look more like a hand, but the real benefit is that it looks really cool to a kid, and a kid just really loves to use it. You can have any color you want. And in terms of customization, as Dr. Berger mentioned, if you want even like Wolverine claws on it or any kind of adaptation that makes it more uh, more uh, amenable to you in personalizing it. These are all things that can be done with like the 3D printing technology that potentially couldn't have been done before. And as opposed to a normal prosthetic, 
which is really just trying to um, look like a normal hand. But the reality is, for both of you, is the functionality of the prosthesis. I mean, that's what it is. In other words, just think of the, the, uh, the opportunity for that young lady going shopping, reaching onto a shelf. I do know that it, at Nicholas Children's we have, we have uh, two excellent uh, craniofacial surgeons, Chad Perlin and, 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 and Tony Wolf. Yeah. Tony Wolf oh, trained to with Wolf. Millard Wright. Oh, and sure. um, he's still very active in practice. Both of them are very active. They see a ton of patients. And we have our own uh, cleft and craniofacial uh, clinic Good. that's multidisciplinary. It includes a geneticist. It includes a dental team. It includes a speech therapist. Um, I'm sure I'm going to miss somebody along the way, but it's yeah. it's a, a, a comprehensive team, and it, it really does change. I'm certain it changes not only the quality of care that patients receive versus being having to go individually to each person, but in, in a multidisciplinary clinic, you have the opportunity to bounce ideas off of each other. I forgot we have an ear, nose, and throat otolaryngology department that also sure. participates in that group. Um, <clears throat> And so I think it's, without question, an important component of cleft uh, and craniofacial care or deformities of the uh, craniofacial deformities that they need to be treated in a multidisciplinary fashion. It's not common, but oftentimes does happen that children are born with both uh, craniofacial anomalies as well as extremity anomalies. And uh, th that's oftentimes when I get involved and I do participate in that clinic at times, uh, especially if I know that a patient has multiple uh, differences that they're born with, um, and I get involved early. It is not uh, another uh, aspect of Nicholas Children's, and a, a place where I see a number of referrals from is from our um, cardiac surgeons. And it turns out that some deformities of the upper extremities, when we're born with deformities of our upper extremity, for whatever reason, some of the genes associated with heart development and the cardiovascular system tend to be uh, uh, changed as well. So it's not uncommon to be part of a multidisciplinary team that takes care of the heart problems and I get involved when uh, there's an upper extremity problem. Well, it's, it's very interesting. Just, uh, uh, John, uh, maybe in your furtherance of your medical knowledge and you're going to be a great doctor. Uh, one of the things, that I, I, I listened to a lecture just a few weeks ago uh, talking about the, the, the genetic continuity uh, or connection between the oral cavity and the other parts of the body. I'd also actually say that the technology actually follows both those things. So as you mentioned, with the three-dimensional printing for, the, for um, some uh, cranial facial issues, uh, such as... Um, uh, some, there was actually a braces that can be printed by 3D printing now. And as well as like some heart issues, you can even model uh, some of these deformities to help with surgery in the future. So with all these issues that I guess are related, you also have the relation of this type of technology, which can be used to treat it as well. Well, my understanding is that, you know, with, with, with the massive changes that have occurred with uh, uh, valvular transplants, which are now done, you know, I mean, it's not... The, the process of which was used less than five years ago, uh, that there's now talk about doing exactly what you just said and replicating the, the various uh, heart valves uh, through the use of a prosthetic device or if that's what you want to call it, in essence it is, that is created by 3D printers. It's probably not far off. Our, our, cardi our cardiac surgeons actually for very complex um, heart anomalies will have a 3D model printed ahead of time and they can study it in much the same way they would study it on a computer screen in two dimensions, but they actually have the 3D model. So there aren't as many surprises when they open up the chest and look at the, look at the vessels themselves and decide which ones need to be connected where. And it's not, it's not that it, far off from what the orthopedic surgeons have been doing for many years in terms of taking a CT scan, turning it into a 3D model, and then planning out how we're going to make cuts to change the shape of a bone. Uh, it's very interesting because we just did a show, I think two, three shows ago, uh, with a, uh, a, well, we were talking about spine surgery, and that's exactly what we discussed, uh, that today is just, you know, it's just not open and look, it's plan, view, then open, and do. 
Sim I mean, yeah. And not, the, I'm <clears throat> putting it into simple terms, but that's what I heard. Right. And custom made, uh, custom made implants are not far off. No. In, in many ways, they're already being used. Yeah. Right. We're down, believe it or not, to the last three minutes of the show. See, things happen <laughs> right. so fast. Uh, but, I, I, Dr. Berger, I, firstly, I, I, I'm really thankful that you're here because I, I think the work that you do is, is more, not only because of medical knowledge, but it's advocacy. And to tell you the truth, it's, uh, you're, uh, you're a blessing to a lot of children, so just know that. Uh, and uh, John, Michelle, uh, you've got a, a history that's about to be created in front of you, so uh, follow Dr. Berger's example but go past him, you know what I mean? He's going to come, come back and teach him something. He'll be different. Uh, but uh, Dr. Berger, just quickly tell us uh, uh, in one minute about Nicholas Children's Hospital and how fantastic it is. It's an outstanding facility. They, we've just completed a huge tower. I personally haven't, but the hospital has. Uh, with state-of-the-art care, there's a number of... One of the best parts, for me at least, and I, I don't know that they advertise this, but in, most of the rooms are single rooms, and it makes it much easier to examine and care for patients when their family can be there in the room with them and not be sort of under the typical environment that a stressful hospital environment can typically be um, with strangers in the next bed, so to speak. Um, the... One of the other benefits of my job is that I get to go all over Dade, County, Dade and Broward County. In fact, I'm in Miramar every Tuesday. I see patients up here. And uh, I, in doing so, I'm able to see that many more patients and, and to treat that many more patients in terms of uh, some of the more unique and not so common things that I like to treat with I respect understand. to hand and upper extremities. And I know that they, they've been very active in telehealth as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, we, had, we did a show about telehealth with the hospital. Well, I want to thank you both for being here. I know that we didn't get into the details of the, the process and otherwise, but I wanted the people to understand because we've had a number of questions relative to special needs children. Uh, we have one of the finest uh, uh, Children's Development Centers in the entire United States in the Mailman Siegel Center right here, which was affiliated with the Mailman Center. Uh, originally the Mailman Center at, uh, Indian, at Jackson. Uh, Jackson Hospital. Uh, but I want to thank you both. Uh, John, uh, Michelle, I wish you best wherever you end up, but come back home. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't stick up there and, you know, in Boston or uh, New York, uh, you know, there are a lot of children down here. Many more children born here than you, than in some of those areas. Uh, and uh, Dr. Berger, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, like I said, for your advocacy and for your love of what you do. And uh, it's very, very important. And uh, we, we appreciate both of you being here. Remember, both these people are, are, are doing this uh, for the, uh, not for just for the sake or the art of creating things, but for the sake and the purpose of uh, helping children and other individuals at some point in time in their life. So uh, thank you very much for showing up again this week. Uh, we appreciate you uh, watching Dateline Health. Uh, remember, this is your show. The questions really and the theme of the show comes from you. So let us know what you want to, us to talk about. And remember, if you have any questions about this show or you want some answers, there's a telephone number and email address right here. And uh, this show is called Dateline Health. We come to you from Nova Southeastern University. As I always tell you, take good care of yourself. My name is Fred Lippman, and until next time, see you.